for the Transvaal from The Traitor's Wife in Unto Dust by Herman Charles Bosman. We did not like the sound of the wind that morning as we cantered over a felt trail we had made much use of during the past year when there were English forces in the neighborhood. The wind blew short wisps of yellow grass in quick flurries over the felt, and the smoke from a fire in front of a row of huts hung low in the air. From this we knew that the third winter of the Anglo-Boer War was approaching. We dismounted at the edge of a clump of camel thorns to rest our horses. Our thoughts went immediately to Leander Teru, who had been with us on commando for a long while, and who had been spoken of as a man likely to become a felt cornet. He had gone out scouting one night, and had never returned. There were, of course, other Boers who had also joined the English, but none that we had respected as much as Leandert Roo. Soon our small group of burghers was on the move again. In the late afternoon we emerged through the crocodile port that brought us in sight of Leander de Roo's farmhouse. Next to the dam was a patch of millies that Leander de Roo's wife had asked the labourers to cultivate. We'll camp on Leander de Roo's farm and eat roast millies tonight, our falconet Api Tron observed. The road we were following led past Leander de Roo's homestead. The noise of our horses' hooves brought Leander Drew's wife, Serfina, to the door. She stood in the open doorway, watching us ride by. Serfina was pretty, taller than most women, and slender. There was no expression in her eyes that you could read, and her face was very white. It was strange, I thought, as we rode past the homestead, that the sight of Serfina Ru did not fill us with bitterness. Yuri Becker said that something about Serfina Ru reminded him of the Transvaal. He said he didn't know what it was, but with the wind of early winter fluttering her dress about her ankles, that was how it seemed to him. Corbus Ferreira then said that he had wanted to shout out something to her when we rode past the door, to let Serfina know how we, who were fighting in the last ditch and in ragged clothing, felt about the wife of a traitor. But she stood there so still, Corbus Ferreira said, I couldn't say anything. Then a remark by Jan Vermeeren reminded us that there was a war on. He had taken the milli sack off his body and threaded a length of baling wire above the places where the holes were. He was now restoring the grain bag to the use it had been intended for, and I suppose that, in consequence, his views also became more sensible. Just because Serfina Ru is pretty, Jan Vermeulen said, flinging mealy heads into the sack. Let us not forget who she is. Perhaps it is not safe for us to camp on this farm tonight. She's sure to be in touch with the English. She may tell them where we are especially now that we've taken her millies. But our felt cornet said that it wasn't important if the English knew where we were. Any person in the neighborhood could go and report our position to them. 
what mattered was that we should know where the English were. And he reminded us that in two years he had never made a serious mistake in that regard. What about the affair at the Sprite, though? Jan Vermeulen asked him. My pipe and tinderbox were in the jacket I had to leave behind there, too. By sunset the wind had died down, but there was a chill in the air. We had pitched our camp in the Tambuki grass on the far side of Leander de Roo's farm. And I was glad, lying in my blankets, to think that it was the turn of the Feldkornet and Yuri Becker to stand guard. Far away a jackal howled. Then there was silence. A little later, the stillness was disturbed by sterner sounds of the felt at night. They did not come from very far away either. They were the sounds made by Yuri Becker, first when he fell over a beacon, and then when he gave his opinion of Leander de Roo for placing a beacon in the middle of a stretch of double key thorns. The blankets felt very snug, pulled over my shoulders when I reflected on those thorns. And because I was young, they came into my thoughts at Yuri Becker's mention of Leander de Roo, the picture of Serfina, as she had stood in front of her doorway. The dream I had of Serfina Roo that night was that she came to me tall and graceful beside a white beacon on her husband's farm. It was that haunting kind of dream in which you half know all the time that you are dreaming. And she was very beautiful in my dream. And it was as though her hair was hanging half out of my dream and reaching down into the wind when she came closer to me. And I knew what she wanted to tell me, but I did not wish to hear it. I knew that if Serfina spoke that thing, I would wake up from my dream. And in that moment, as always happens in a dream, Serfina spoke. Opskut, Carols, I heard. But it was not Serfina who gave that command. It was Apitron, the Feldkornet. He came running into the camp with his rifle at the trail. Serfina was gone, and in a few minutes we had saddled our horses and were ready to gallop away. Many times during the past couple of years our scouts had roused us thus, when an English column was approaching. We were already in the saddle when Arpi Tron let us know what was afoot. He had received information, he said, that Leandert Roo had that very night ventured back to his homestead. If we hurried, we might trap him in his own house. The Feldkornet warned us to take no chances, reminding us that when Leander Roo had stood on our side, he had been a fearless and resourceful fighter. So we rode back during the night, along the same way we had come in the afternoon. We tethered our horses in a clump of trees near the mealy lands, and started to surround the farmhouse. When we saw a figure running from the stable at the side of the house, we realized that Leander Roo had been almost too quick for us. In the cold, thin breeze that springs up just before dawn, we surprised Leander Roo at the door of his stable. But when he made no resistance, it almost seemed as though Leander Roo had taken us by surprise. Leander Roo's calm acceptance of his fate made it seem almost as though he had never turned traitor, 
but that he was laying down his life for the Transvaal. In answer to the Feldkornet's question, Leander Teru said that he would be glad if we could read Psalm 110 over his grave. He also said that he did not want his eyes bandaged, and he asked to be allowed to say goodbye to his wife. Sarfina was sent for, at the side of the stable, in the early morning breeze, Leonard and Sarfina Ru, husband and wife, bade each other farewell. Sarfina looked even more shadowy than she had done in my dream, when she set off back to the homestead, along the footpath through the thorns. The sun was just beginning to rise, and I understood how right Yuri Becker had been when he had said that she was just like the Transvaal, with the dawn breeze fluttering her skirts about her ankles as it rippled the grass. And I remembered that it was the Boer woman who kept on when their menfolk had recoiled before the steepness of the Drakensberg and spoken of turning back. I also thought of how strange it was that Serfina should have come walking over to our camp in the middle of the night, just as she had done in my dream. But where my dream was different was that she had reported not to me, but to our Feldkornet, the whereabouts of Leonard Roo.